Hello and welcome to Basin Academy. This is your safety instructor, Jonathan Greiner. Today you'll be covering slip trips, falls, and walking working surfaces. Believe it or not, one person dies every single day from falling. From somewhere, same level, different level, doesn't matter. So don't trip, brother. Watch where you're going. Keep your eyes on the path. And with that, let's get this safety started. All right, breaking this topic down into its constituent parts, uh, we have a few different topics here. We're going to talk about the definitions of slip, trip, and fall. Even though it's relatively common sense, we're going to go through it anyway. Uh, statistics of slip, trips, and falls, or STFs, as well as risk of STFs. This is not to be confused with STDs. That's a completely different uh, safety regulation topic, which we're not going to be covering today. Regulatory information, general causes of slip, trips, and falls, factors that increase the likelihood of slip, trips, and falls, and lastly, how do you prevent slip trips and falls? A lot of people are going to say this is common sense, just like the definitions, but the statistics don't lie. We're going to get into those in a minute. I mean, it's almost one person per day dies of falling at the workplace, and about 100 people per day have a serious fall that, re that results in a hospitalization or an amputation, believe it or not. 100 people every day. So if it was pure common sense, maybe those statistics would be different. So defining slip strips and falls. A slip is a, occurs when there are two uh, when there is too much little traction of, or friction between the shoe and the walking surface. So you know there's some sort of slide that occurs, friction is relegated, completely gone, and there's a slip that happens. Now what can turn into a trip is if there's an obstacle in that person's path. And sometimes it can be their own foot, it can be a change in grade or elevation, um, and that can throw them off that person off balance. And a fall occurs when weight distribution allows for gravity to overcome balance. And if you've been through any of our, you know, loader operations, forklift operations courses, even our aerial lift, you recognize the importance of the center of balance, center of gravity, staying central to the object, and a person's no different. So there are some personal factors that can affect this as well, which we'll cover. But uh, on to the next slide. So same level fall is essentially what it, what it sounds like. Someone's on the exact same level where they're working or walking, and the fall occurs. Now, this can happen because of debris in the way. There's a slippery surface. Uh, there's a slight change in grade or elevation or hoses, cords, things of that nature get in the way, and they trip and they fall. Or from an elevation, and this is where it's not a change in grade, but actually a different height, and this can be as simple as a crack in the sidewalk. It can be a 5-foot fall, a 6-foot fall. 10 foot fall, etc. So those uh, falls from elevation typically are a little bit more severe. You have more weight and pressure and gravity affecting you uh, when you go to fall. So ladders, stairs, platforms, loading docks, as I mentioned, uneven ground, even rocks, um, depending on where you're working, can be uh, the, a cause of fall from an elevation. So I mentioned we get into statistics here, and I kind of already gave away the, the cow here, but from 10 2020 to 10 2021, 2000 864 workplace falls occurred. Now, you know, I emphasize that point for a reason. That's just a lot. You know, 100 falls a day, and those result in, excuse me, th those result in hospitalization or amputation. That's that, Those are some serious numbers, and I'm actually going to link you guys to some research that we've done here at Basin Academy for you to be able to look through the actual reasons for those falls, dates, locations, and some of the basic, you know, again, the basic, uh, history and, and the reason that, that fall occurred because I know I know you're surfing OSHA on the daily but I've actually went through the pro well, of course you're doing that but I've actually went through the process of uh, taking all that data putting it into one place and saying hey of all these OSHA fatalities and serious injuries that happen how many of them are how many of them are fall related and it's 2,864 in one year in 2021 uh, just the, you know the entire year 272 workplace fatalities occurred due to falling that's about a death per work day uh, that occurs. So again, one person every single day in America, and this is just America, dies from some sort of fall. It's pretty pretty stark stats there. So going a little bit more in the statistics percentage-wise, from 10 2020 to 10 2021, 30% of all workplace accidents were falls, and in 2021, 22% of all workplace fatalities were fall-related. So just to put this in perspective, and again, if you've been through our uh, electrical safety uh, training and our um, struck by, caught in between training, 
you'll note that the statistics kind of add up here. We have 30% of workplace accidents uh, struck by, caught in between. That's 40% of workplace accidents. And then electrical, you know, being electrocuted or, or harmed by electricity is another 15%. So you have 15, 40, and 30. That's 85%. So if you can avoid, if you can really pay attention to where you're going, where you're walking, keep your eyes on the path, not on the phone, or not have something obstructing you uh, while you're walking. Uh, avoid things hitting you, uh, either dropping on you or hitting you from the side. And just kind of, you know, keep a safe, respectful difference from electricity. You're 85% likely to be in a serious injury at work. Just those three, those three very basic things. Um, so again, the stats are not friendly uh, when it comes to slips, trips, and falls. So again, you know, it's a little bit hard as an instructor to really go hard on slip, trips, and falls. Uh, pardon the double there, but uh, it's just difficult. It's like, hey, you know, this, you know, this is kind of it's pretty straightforward. Like, don't trip. Uh, but <laughs> you know, it's it's got to be more complicated than that with these kind of statistics. So the costs are obviously, and this is for any injury, but you know, just breaking it down for you. Pain, lost wages, temporary or permanent disability, reduced quality of life, depression and inconvenience, uh, which obviously result from those injuries, amputations, et cetera, that do happen when people fall. Uh, ladders are a big culprit. You know, I, I kind of breezed over that earlier, but ladders, uh, roofs, you know, uh, working in construction. Uh, another one is tree trimming. I don't know if the trees are angry with people, but if you look through those statistics that I link you to, you're going to note that a lot of people that die in the United States every single year involve trees of some sort. So there's some domestic violence. You know, there's there's some wives that come to the, and I'm not joking, uh, there's some wives that come to the office and, you know, kind of go postal on people. That statistically happens. I'm not just, you know, making a joke. It, you know, you'll read it in the stats that I, sh that I share with you. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons that people uh, get hurt at work, but falls definitely high up there. Trees also extremely high up there. So if you're working with trees, be very careful. So some regulatory information. Uh, slips, trips, and falls, because they occur anywhere and have various causal factors, OSHA has numerous standards that address them. Um, subpart D covers all working, walking, working services for general industry. Obviously, we have fall protection, which typically falls more on the construction side, but does hit us on general industry. And for mo most of you that have been in the safety world or working around safety for a while, you know that there are different heights uh, between construction and general industry for fall protection, six feet to four feet. But in, in CFR 1910, which is general industry, that 1910, general requirements, it specifies that, and that's 1910-22, all areas of employments must be kept clean and sanitary. Uh, floors shall be kept clean and dry, and where wet processes are used, aisles and passageways shall be kept clear and in good repair, and permanent aisles and passageways must be marked, which kind of leads us into the walking working services uh, part B of this training. And I merge these together because they're so connected in so many different ways, but uh, that's kind of the regulatory requirement. There's a little bit more here, which we're gonna address in the next slide. 1910-141, sanitation further specifies that the floor every worker uh, has to work on shall be remain as dry as, as practical. And again, practical, depending on what you do, right? If you're mopping the floor, then, you know, you're going to make the floor wet, so it's not going to be dry immediately. If wet processes are used in that instance, for example, proper drainage and dry standing places, mats, platforms should be provided. This obviously doesn't happen very often. I don't think it's too complicated as something to ask, but you know, typically takes some serious incident or lawsuit for people to kind of change their methods here. Uh, 1910 guarding floor and wall opening the holes. Again, this kind of bleeds into the walking working service a little bit, but stairway floor openings must be guarded. Ladder floor openings or platforms shall be guarded, and any floor hole that can be walked into must have standard railing or tow board surrounding it, or it has to be covered up, right? That's, those are kind of the rules, and we'll get more into that, and again, in part B of this presentation. So getting into the causes a little bit, causes of slips, wet, uh, wet spills or contamination on floors, uh, very commonly will cause us a slip if you haven't experienced this before, just wait a little while. Water, mud, oil, grease, food, etc. I mean, worn out boots can all, and we're going to get into this a little bit later, but worn out boots can also um, cause this. I have to change mine out about once a year. In, in Williston, North Dakota, where I reside most of the time, we used to have this shoe doctor where he'd actually, you know, pull your whole... Uh, heel and your sole off and replace the whole dang thing that doesn't exist anymore so you just gotta essentially buy a new pair of boots uh, dry contamination on floors can also cause slips depending on you know uh, if it's a fiber you know how uh, granular it is but dust powders 
wood, lint, plastic, etc. All these sorts of things. And again, depending on the surface tension of the floor, is it a waxed floor? Uh, is it dry concrete? You know, these these sorts of things are going to need to be taken into uh, context as well. So some more causes of slips. Again, polished floors, marble, terrace, ceramic tile, uh, terrazzo. Uh, excuse me, fresh waxed floors and transitioning from one surface to another. Carpet to a smooth surface. I have a dog loves to run through the house, and I got some smooth surfaces. And uh, yeah, that's he makes uh, his whole life is slipping uh, across the kitchen floor. Some other uh, causes of slips: sloped walking working surfaces as I mentioned earlier, grades, uh, loose unacred mats or rugs, loose tiles or floorboards, and wet, muddy, or greasy shoes, or just you know, candidly, uh, shoes with uh, loss of grip. Ramps without skid or slip resistant surfaces can also cause slips. I mean, if you've ever had to move, I'm in the process of moving my wife right now, and you know, this is definitely something we gotta <laughs> be careful of. If it rains, metal surfaces such as platforms, construction plates, or covers, all these sorts of things, you know, cause a slip. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean every slip. In fact, we know that every slip doesn't result in a hospitalization. Otherwise, a lot of us uh, would have been in and out of the hospital many times. But, you know, it's just, you know, you slip and then what? Are you, you know, six feet above the next platform? Is there something you can fall into that can hurt you? Like what's going on around you? And that's kind of what essentially what we would consider common sense. But, you know, no one's no one's walking around thinking, i got to be careful. I might slip. You know, no one's thinking that until it happens. And then you're like, whoa, I hope no one noticed that. Right. Um, it does happen. So you almost want to keep that in the back of your mind, especially if it's, again, greasy, muddy, uh, rainy, etc. Or you're working on surfaces that don't have a lot of traction to them. So some more causes of slips. Now, this one is probably the most common in our industry that I see where people get hurt is getting in and out of vehicles, uh, even if it's just a truck. Trailer, lawnmowers, other heavy equipment, climbing up and down ladders, and if you add water, mud, or grease to any of these surfaces, especially, you know, uh, depending on rocks, which I'll get into a little bit, um, these things increase the likelihood. And again, with all safety things, I can't stress enough, this comes down to statistics. So if you slip a hundred times, for example, and let's say a month, a week, you know, take the range of time and, and flex it and squeeze it. Um, I, of those hundred times, one of those is bound to be something more serious. You can pull a muscle at you know least case, or again fall into something. So eliminating the likelihood of slipping by kind of having those causal factors taken care of uh, benefits you in the long term. And a lot of times, again, truck drivers rolled ankles the most common. You know, getting out of a truck on scoria. I don't know how many of these I've responded to over the years, done an incident report on, but it's pretty much the same story. They either didn't use three points of contact or just weren't paying attention. So environmental factors, I mentioned rain, but also frost, snow, uh, humid surfaces as well. If you're down south, especially south central in Houston, uh, you do, or Louisiana, you do have a lot more humid temperatures, uh, humid barometer throughout the year. Uneven surfaces or terrain, irregular surfaces such as gravel as, or scoria, which we've all experienced, these are causes of slips. Now getting into trips, causes of trips, uh, un un uncovered cables, wires, or extension cords. Now again, this is obvious, but it's also statistically very common that this is what people trip over. Clutter, obstacles, and walkways people trip over. Also open cabinets, desk drawers, uh, table, people just not paying attention. You know, trips, trips happen that way. Uh, changes in elevation, unmarked steps, for example, carpets or mats that are not laying flat or ever rolled up edges. Missing or uneven floor tiles, irregular walking surfaces. Now this slide here is my most common reason for tripping. In fact, these stairs right here, I actually uh, had a little near trip up. I'm glad I was uh, uh, having three points of contact because like every single time I'd go up them, I was inspecting a rig here and I'd almost fall every single time, even though I knew it was coming. Like, you know, I'd kind of get focused ahead of me and almost trip. Um, damaged steps, uh, non-uniform or irregular steps. In this case, you have both. You can kind of notice if you look closely enough that these steps were not manufactured evenly. They're different rise heights on different steps, and some of that's because of the deformity of them, and, and other others are just because that's the way they were manufactured. And if you have a staircase, for me anyway, if you have a staircase where there's different rise lengths, it, I'm a sucker for that. I'm going to fall or nearly trip every single time. So I just make it a habit. I always have a hand on a handrail. It's just kind of a personal thing and I don't know if it, I don't consciously do it necessarily but you know I definitely notice that when I um, almost trip a lot of times on uneven stairs that hey I'm glad I you know use three points contact 
some other kinds of trips, uh, accumulated waste in areas, uh, again, tables, uh, pallets, tools in walkways, objects uh, protruding from walking surfaces, uneven surfaces, again, you'll see that pop up a lot, and then sidewalks, curb drops, especially in construction sites. So here I was on a Costco job, um, and you can see that there's a lot of material here in the way where guys are, are potentially walking right in the walkway. So we all just kind of had to avoid that area. Um, and that was just kind of poor planning on the contractor's part. And I gave him a hard time for it, but ultimately, fortunately, no one did slip, trip, or fall that I know of on that job. So that was good. That's the Costco and Bismarck, by the way. Causes of trips. Again, I said I'd mentioned scoria, and here's an example. But also tank farm liners. Uh, if you've been out there you know, working on uh, production facilities where they have these liners, they are a slippery slippery surface uh, as well as ice and ruts um, around locations these all these are potential causes of trips so some conditions increasing the risk of slip trips and falls as i mentioned you know so you add all those things right ruts uneven surfaces scoria working on ladders or snow there's ice now you add in a couple different factors poor lighting a glare um, having bulky equipment ppe itself can be a hazard uh, Loud noise or distraction, temperature, humidity, or precipitation, again, on the ground, also just kind of keeping you from being fully focused, and traffic type or volume. So, what you know, I'm in Houston right now, and this town, I, I told my wife that you don't drive through Houston. You uh, avoid accidents from point A to point B. That's You don't actually just, like, enjoy a drive like you do in most cities. Uh, maybe, maybe they're all this way, but I've definitely recognized this in Houston. Uh, you know, it's just like, man, every everywhere you turn, people are not paying attention. And the more traffic there is, the worse that is. And again, that's a uh, increased causal factor for slips, trips, and falls as well. So increasing uh, some other conditions, increasing the risk of slip, trips, and falls. If you're carrying an object, again, that's going to be affecting your center of gravity. Uh, if you're walking normally while carrying a heavy object, your center of gravity is going to be off. You are going to have to change uh, your carrying uh, methodology. And obviously, the lower you can carry something, uh, the better. Uh, pushing or pulling objects and then a change in elevation again uh, or direction while walking. So, you know, using that pivot foot, um, if you're a basketball guy, uh, even soccer, you know, you see it a lot. People slip, trip, and fall while changing directions. It happens. Uh, again, they're on a nice soft grass field or turf field. If you're out there in the oil field, you may not be so lucky to land on a nice, uh, you know, uh, pasture of grass. So some other personal risks, as I mentioned, age, um, just you know, muscular, musculoskeletal strength, uh, body shape, size, and math, uh, mass rather, gait dynamics, and this all I guess does come down to math, but gait dynamics, physical condition, illness, physiological factors such as factors such as stress and distractions, medications, alcohol or drug effects, as well as visual perception and eyesight, all of these things. Again, and so breaking it down, this is a common sense topic. And for the most part, I would agree with you. But breaking it down, there's so many different things that can affect someone's balance and center of gravity as they go throughout their day, especially on a job site with uneven surfaces, uh, location like pit liners, uh, ruts, scoria, all these different things. These uh, do have you know a kind of a cumulative effect to create the opportunity for slips, trips, and falls. So factors increasing uh, the risk of slips, trips, and falls. Now we're not going to get into all those are relatively uncontrolled physical factors to a certain extent. Maybe not so much the physical uh, aspects, but to some extent they are. I mean, if you're 63, you're 63. There's not a lot you can do to control that. Uh, but here are some behaviors that increase the likelihood, and I would say t statistical likelihood, of slips, trips, and falls. Poor housekeeping, allowing clutter to accumulate, not cleaning up spills or material on the ground in a timely manner using improper cleaning processes, overusing uh, wax or polish on floors, or using water to clean up a grease space, uh, grease space build, essentially not using the right cleaner to clean the floor that you're working with uh, to increase the friction of the people walking by. And also you fall, failing to use signs uh, when slip trips and fall hazards are present. Caution, uh, for example, I mean, this does happen. I mean, people get sued for it where they don't put out the sign uh, where they should and when they should. So most importantly here, slips, trips, and falls are preventable. Uh, you know, if you're a supervisor, I'm going to talk to you for a second. So if you're in leadership and you got three, four guys working with you that day, right? I'm going to put the onus on you 
as kind of the guy in charge to think through the day when you're starting, when you're doing your JSA and kind of planning out the day from a, both a safety and operations perspective. Look around, hey, we're going to do task A, B, and C today. Um, that's going to take us over here, over there, and back at the edge of location or the back at the edge of the, the job site. I'm going to do a quick walk around before we even get started and see if there's anything that's going to obstruct us from doing that effectively, efficiently, and safely, of course. Um, doing that first, you know, kind of walk around and inspection of a job site before you go to work is vital in preventing the slip, trip, and fall from occurring. So in that, we're modifying our workspaces uh, to reduce the likelihood of, of an incident and reduce hazards. Uh, practicing good housekeeping, you know, I'm a big fan of like cleaning up as you go. Um, I have some guys that work for me that aren't uh, quite in the same mindset as I am on that. And I'm sure that you maybe have some guys you work with that are the same, but it's constant coaching. You know, if people don't clean up a lot at home, it's likely they're not going to clean up a lot at work. So that's a personal hygiene and behavior choice that needs to be coached uh, into people. And again, I'm talking to you supervisors. Uh, wearing proper footwear, using ladders and stairs with caution, obviously, and then practice safe walking procedures. Now, what does that mean? I mean, if I came out and I'm like, hey, guys, I got a product for you. I'm going to sell you safe walking procedures. It's $52.99. You'd be like, get out of here, bro. <laughs> like, you know, so, so I was like, I want to teach you how to walk safe. You'd be like, get, you know, what are you talking about? Um, so it, I, I recognize it's a little bit ridiculous in some aspect to, to come at it from that angle. But again, think about the statistics. You got 100 people every single day that fall so, so badly. And some of this may be, again, musculoskeletal. I mean, you're 75 and you fall on the job site, you're probably going to break a hip. Like, you could fall on a mattress and you might break a hip. But 100 people a day, that's not all just age and physical biochemistry. There's a lot more at play there. So practicing safe walking procedures, keeping it simple, you know, really has to do with looking around you, thinking about the work you're going to do today, and is there something that could prevent you from doing that and keeping your center of gravity. So again, uh, workspace and work practice design, making sure stuff's uh, cleared before you go to work and ensure adequate lighting to keep air work areas lit and, you know, visible for everybody. And this can be hard, especially if, you know, North Dakota, when you have four hours of light uh, in the wintertime and you got 12 hours worth of work to do, it can be challenging. I know a company man uh, out out there, um, big shout out, you know, he's probably going to be listening to this later this month, um, who has like a, he travels with this little light plant. He plugs into his truck and he hooks it into his bumper and puts it up so that the guys can see because um, they don't have enough light plants out there. So he kind of solved that problem himself. And he likes to make the guys work late. So a shout out and a little bit of a diss there. Um, but uh, and make them work early. So, he, but you know, hey, if you're gonna work, you know, early or late, and it's dark outside, bring some light. That's a it's a valiant effort, sir. Workspace and work practice design um, is another you know thing that we can do to prevent slips. Uh, highlighting step edges and transitions. Uh, some places do this. That's not a terrible idea. Uh, making sure stairways have sufficient lighting and handrails and anti-slip coating and tape where applicable. You know, and this this really again. No one's just going to do this, right? Like, I'm not walking in out of my garage thinking, man, I wonder if I need some anti-slip tape over here. Like, you're not doing that. That's not the way that you're thinking, right? You'd have to, like, intentionally walk through a space and say, hey, is there any area in this space that I walk through or we walk through where someone might trip and fall? And if they did fall, they'd fall into, you know, this rebar or these tools or this bench that's sharp or, you know, this vice on the edge of the, the bench, whatever it is you almost have to intentionally do that and kind of think it through. Um, I'm not saying go overboard here, but without intentionality, we're not going to see security. Workspace and work practice design, again, making sure that uh, work processes uh, where slippery surface may occur, you're going to have mats or some sort of um, you know, grip, uh, some high friction material. Use drainage or false floors where needed, and then also use slip resistant floors and high risk areas like entrances you know we always put mats or carpets in our entrances uh, to shop there just to make sure that you know if you come in with muddy boots or, or wet boots that the first carpet or the first surface you hit is carpet which will help dry that off safe working procedures so we want to keep eyes on path at all times this is an old equinor um, if you ever worked for them you remember this 
an old Equinor saying they'd use, and I'm sure they weren't the first one, but it's the first place I heard it, uh, keeping your eyes on the path while walking uh, the work area and work site. No need to run, hurry, or scurry to where you're going. Uh, don't read, write, or work while walking, and this is hard with a cell phone, like, hey, I'm going from point A to point B. I got 13 calls in the last 20 minutes. I'm gonna check my voicemails or check my texts that I got while I'm going from point A to point B. Uh, use three points of contact on stairs, ladders, etc. And then especially when getting out of equipment, make sure to use those three points of contact. And then bring a flashlight or headlamp with you if you're gonna go into a dim area. Um, you know, I have a, one of those intrinsically safe headlamps. I think Streamlight makes it. Uh, we actually sell them at the shop there. You can get them online. They're, you know, not that expensive. Uh, it's a good idea to just ha kind of have that in the truck, in the door of your truck, so that if you ever are in an area where you need a headlamp, you have one handy. Safe walking procedures, some other ones before you lift anything. Make sure your path is clear, your view's not obstructed. Utilize carts if you can. Don't carry anything that you can't see over or around. Really, that's, even if it's light, you know, again, walking into things can cause a trip because there's an obstruction of your walking, right? Pretty straightforward. And then carry small loads close to your body. And again, lower is better for your center of gravity. It's not always better for your back. And if you duck walk around the shop carrying a box, you're probably going to get some, uh, <clears throat> probably get some, uh, some flack for that. Just saying. So grab a cart, you know, let them give you crap for that. So procedures in winter, which, you know, we can't talk about slip strips and falls and avoid talking about winter. So making sure you have appropriate footwear for winter, and again, this is the main reason I have to switch out my boots every year, is ice, because you know older boots that are worn down a little bit do not handle ice very well. The friction uh, factor is not uh, working in your favor. Um, shoes with substantial soles, overshoes if necessary, um, and we'll get into a few different types of um, kind of external grips that you can use. Definitely slowing down, doing the penguin walk um, as you're going from point A to point B. Uh, heightened awareness of your surroundings and take your time when walking on potentially slippery surfaces such as ice and round locations, etc. And when entering buildings, again, knock off as much uh, material as you can before you go trudging through uh, the building and on potentially slippery work surfaces. So some external footwear options. You have chains, not my favorite, but some people like them. Uh, PVC grips, again, not my favorite, but some people like them. And midsole cleats. And there you have my favorite. I, I saved the best for last. Uh, the reason I like these is, again, you're talking about center of gravity. The center, or you know, your midsole, is a straight line uh, to the top of your head, your center of balance right there, straight down to the ground. And when you have good traction there, it's likely that you're going to have good traction across the, the base of your foot. So if you slip there, you have your entire grip left to, to catch you, or if you uh, slip while you're, you're getting to that point, once it catches that midsole, which is typically extended beyond the edge of your grips, you're going to get your you're going to catch your balance on the ice. So watch for ice. Be careful at heights. Make sure you got your if you in this case, the gentleman's doing a great job. He is at heights um, above four feet. There's no guardrail while he's installing the rig floor here, but he's tied off just to make sure that if he did slip and fall, he'd have something to catch him. All right, today we're going to be talking about walking working services. Again, this is part B of the slips, trips, and falls kind of breaking this topic down a little bit. Um, we, we're going to talk about housekeeping for sure. Guardrails, loading requirements, floor openings and guards, scaffolding, ladders, heavy equipment and vehicles, and then we're going to wrap up the entire show. So housekeeping, um, I, I did mention this before. I'm going to try not to layer on too thick here from what we've already covered, but uh, keeping walkways and aisles and stairs clean of clutter, very important. Uh, cover or secure cords, cables, wires, or hoses, and make sure that we're keeping them away from high traffic areas. Um, better yet, you know, if you can use uh, tools or equipment without cords, that's great. But if not, run that, you know, get a longer extension cord instead of running across the aisleway, run it parallel to the wall um, so you have shorter distances of uh, trip hazards or cover them, you know, which most people aren't going to carry around a cover to use a drill or something. Um, so, you know, again, longer extension cords is kind of the probably the easiest method to, to have a good safe work practice and behavior. So some additional housekeeping items here. Um, I'm gonna mention it again, but briefly, keeping floors free of mud, water, grease, and debris. If there is a spill, clean it up immediately and block off contaminated areas. If you gotta go get a mop, uh, put up a sign if you can. I'm assuming you're not carrying around a three foot guardrail under 42 inch, of course, guardrail on under each arm as you go throughout your day. 
and people do blow past signs uh, again Houston traffic do you want to see a little bit of that just come down here drive around for a day or two uh, did you know that the beltway around Houston by the way is just a little bit uh, it's trivia here the beltway around Houston the outer belt is as large as in service area the state of Connecticut it's pretty impressive that's actually the better area to be driving through Houston is on the outer beltway because the inner beltway Again, want to watch people blow past signs. You just come there. People do blow past signs. So barriers are nice, but you don't always have them. But moving on. I digress. Aisles and passageways, uh, we want to keep those clear if they exist. Make sure that, you know, there's nothing obstructing people. And there is a nice, dry, clean, wide area of, of uh, egress. And if you don't know, the width of these is actually determined uh, for wheelchairs. So the people in wheelchairs... Uh, can get through there so again you may not be in a wheelchair but that doesn't mean the people that are in a wheelchair don't want to have well, don't want to be able to get from point a to point b so keep those aisles clear so that everybody can get to where they're going so covers and guardrails go over this really quick so basically if your foot can fall through something and there's actually a, a, a size to this i want to say it's six inches and maybe four there's actually a three-day class on floor holes yes three days osha puts it on very exciting, I'm sure. I haven't taken it myself, but uh, I'm sure it's riveting. It'll uh, inspire you to, to be a better person all around. So three-day, four-hole class for Moshe. Um, but really, just if your foot can fall through, it's four to six inches, we'll, we'll just kind of keep that as our, as our range. You need to cover it. It needs to be covered so that people's feet can't fall through. Same thing through walls. If you're in the construction world, if someone could fall through a wall, there's not a guardrail up, there must be a guardrail, or that hole needs to be covered. Pits, tanks, etc., someone can fall in it needs to be protected so floor loading protection is, is another one um, when you design a building a lot of times you know especially in these bigger shops um, they don't they don't put in an office they just leave it open and then you know it, the secondary contractor comes in and builds an office and then people look around and they say hey we're not going to build a second office floor but let's put a loft up there we can store material and I've seen some doozies of people um, putting up uh, crazy stuff up on top of it. You can see everything bowing. You can see the guardrail coming off, stuff almost falling onto people when they're just like going about their business, uh, floors sagging, etc. So definitely you want to be mindful of load restrictions and also make sure that load restrictions exist. And if you have a second floor, you got to make sure that there's a load restriction rating for that floor. Floor openings again. Okay, there it is, 12 inches. I thought it was six or four. Let's let's stick with the six or four on the you know the more pragmatic type, but the actual number is 12 inches. Uh, and it's least to mention a floor platform, pavement, or yard through which persons may fall is considered a floor opening. Again, three day class. Should have taken it. I'd have got that number right. But yes, it's 12 inches or more. Uh, guarding floor opening. So the specific way to do that is you need to have a mid rail, a top rail, and a tow board. Now we've seen these. This is kind of standard across the United States. Is in, not everywhere, but in the United States, Canada, um, England, and the like, Australia. Um, so this consists of a top rail, mid rail, and posts. And standard tow board is four inches high with not more than a quarter inch clearance above the floor. Question I get often asked is, can a two by four setup be used in this capacity? And the answer is yes, and probably not. Um, the reason for the probably not is it has to be able to withstand 200 pounds of outward force. So can you construct a 2x4 mid-rail, top-rail, tow board situation that will withstand 200 pounds of outward pressure at any point along that system? Yes, you can. Um, usually we're not going to waste that much wood, so it's usually better just to get one that's designed and constructed uh, with that in mind. So again, floor hole 12 inches. In this case, same thing, cover it or put a guardrail around it. Now, in this specific picture, if you put a guardrail around this, you know, maybe 13, 14 inch hole, I'm going to, I don't know. I mean, I'd be impressed, really, actually, come to think of it. Uh, but most times you're going to, you know, use up some plate steel to cover this up and not build a 30, you know, a 42 inch high guardrail around this. You, you may be in a little bit of trouble if you uh, go ahead and weld that together. Open-sided floors and platforms, same story. Uh, here's an example of an unguarded platform. Again, you have, and this doesn't, you see a lot of people say, oh, it's it's uh, it's not 42 inches, 42 inches high, or excuse me, four feet off the ground. You don't need to protect it. Well, OSHA says something different. If it's four feet or more above adjacent floor, it does have to have a standard railing or equivalent. Now, don't get me wrong. If it's three foot 11 and three quarter inches, and OSHA shows up and someone has fallen and got amputated, 
you still may be in a little bit of trouble. So it's really about the intent here, not the letter. Again, if people can fall, protect them from falling. So many people fall. Just prevent it from happening. Be proactive. Um, you know, install equipment that'll prevent people from falling. So I'm going to get into scaffolding very quickly, only because I'm going to be talking about scaffolding, stairways, and ladders. Um, scaffolding must be capable of supporting four times the maximum intended load. Again, with these, you need to have qualified uh, erectors build these, and they have to be essentially, you know, know what they're doing, and they have to be designed and manufactured for this purpose. Use wire mesh between the tow board and scarred rail if people work or pass underneath, and must be equipped with access ladder equivalent. You can do stairs, I mean, a lot of different uh, configurations with scaffolding out there, but again, need to be uh, uh, established and erected by qualified personnel. So stairways, flight or stairs with four or more risers, and again, that's going to put us in the four, you know, foot kind of, you know, based on typical rise or standard rise run capacity, that's going to put us at four feet, so they must have handrails, so four or more risers, so, and that includes the bottom, the, the, the floor level as to the first step is one rise and all the way to the top, so essentially if you have three steps, that'd be four rises, uh, if you do the math there. So fixed industrial stairs, I'm using this image again because it is fantastic. Treads must be slip resistant with uniform rise height and tread width. Must be able to carry five times expected load, minimum of 1,000 pounds. Minimum width of 22 inches. Now I'm assuming that this staircase here was not overwhelmed with minimum of 1,000 pounds. I think it was just a big boy walking up and down there a lot and eventually bent, bent that out. Now the staircase is probably extremely light, it's aluminum, but again, and you can see a crack there on the third run up from the if you look uh, there's a there's a little crack in that it's starting to fall apart so if you know if it's not designed and manufactured by a company that makes these uh, for real then it's probably not going to meet the standard ladder safety um, yeah, this is one of my favorite photos as well uh, make sure footwear is clean and dry before ascending or descending that will hopefully you descend with the dry footwear, not like get to the top and then put on the dry footwear and then descend. So before ascending, uh, make sure you got clean and dry uh, footwear. Make sure ladder rungs are clean and dry as well. Face the ladder at all times. Never look away from the ladder. Maintain three points of contact at all times, which can be difficult with tools. And that's why you need a tool belt or equivalent. And place your foot on the step, your rung, excuse me, on the step or rung under the arch of your foot. So again, that center of gravity point is going to be in your arch. And this is a time where you would not want to wear the midsole cleat because that's what's actually going to, you know, uh, be your center of gravity here. So step on them on firm, uh, position them rather on firm and solid ground. Uh, use the right height ladder for the job. Inspect them before using them. There's a four to one ratio, which is, means essentially from the point of contact from the top of that ladder, the bottom of that ladder needs to be four feet, or excuse me, one fourth of a factor from the height or that point of contact. So you have a 20 foot point of contact, the bottom, if you divide that by four, the bottom of that ladder must be five feet from um, the edge of that wall. So that's kind of our, our factor there. There's an app for this if you need it, uh, or you can do the straight math with the tape measure. Uh, it's 100% up to you. If ladder is set up in passageways or areas of traffic, obviously we need to make sure it's clear, secure, and blocked off um, uh, from the traffic area. And it's not a bad idea to secure your ladder anyway all the time. I'm not going to discourage that, but it's not necessarily required, uh, believe it or not. But it does have to be designed for the purpose you're using it with. And this is a, kind of a no-no using an A-frame as, an, as a, um, it's kind of a, a, an angled ladder situation. So some other don'ts here. Um, obviously, power lines are kind of a definitely don't use the power line as a, uh, as a point of support for your ladder. That's definitely a no-no. Uh, we don't want to lean too far over there are actually believe it or not ladder platforms that are designed to link between ladders but they have to be actually manufactured for that purpose and then obviously we don't want to put them in the bucket of a piece of equipment and there's a lot of photos you might be like who would ever do that but there's a lot of photos out there of this exact situation so it does happen so fixed ladders covering this really briefly this law is uh, likely to change this year you know who knows with the regulatory environment if that'll happen but um, they have to be permanently attached to the structure uh, 20 feet or longer uh, with a maximum unbroken length of 30 feet. Um, so essentially what that means is in this case you can see here they have a platform where um, you actually get off of that that rise and then go to the platform and then uh, send up a different rise. And this is so that you kind of limit uh, the length of fall. 
mounting and dismounting equipment safely. I kind of mentioned this briefly in the in part A of this training, but make sure shoes are clean as again. Make sure the step foot holder platform that you're going to be using is clean, free of defects and secured properly. Always face the equipment and have a firm hold with your hands and step up, placing your foothold onto the arch again. That's your best point of, uh, of center of gravity. Always having three points of contact. That's one hand, two feet, and two feet, one hand. And do not jump off equipment when dismounting. If you got to reach real far and kind of do the tippy toe situation, it's always better than jumping. I mean, your ankles and knees might be able to take it when you're 19, 20, but as we get a little bit older, that's not always the case. Housekeeping, workplaces must be kept clean, orderly, and sanitary. This prevents people from slipping. Uh, floors uh, should be maintained. as clear and dry as possible you know we don't want to have congested stuff slippery surfaces etc and this can happen in the course of a job pretty quickly right um you know we were dealing with a, a spud rig this week you know when they're pulling casing um or tripping out because something stuck or, or plugged or whatever there's going to be fluid everywhere on that floor there's no way to prevent it so um in that case you know they can't have it be clean and dry all the time so they have to figure out other methods to prevent people from slipping and falling so any deck or you know platform above four feet, um, the <clears throat> needs to have uh, some sort of handrail. Uh, needs to be able to withstand the outward push of 200 pounds. Is kind of the number. Um, so a fall prevention system, like for example, this gentleman here, uh, if he had a <clears throat> you know something that he could anchor to with even just a short um, you know tie off belt or whatever. Um, he would be fine. You know, you can, you can have a two foot lanyard or a three foot lanyard that prevents you from falling over the edge rather than having something, you know, 18 or 20 feet up that you're connected to. So inspection, obviously prior every day before using it, it needs to be inspected. Uh, if it's not working, uh, take it out of service. You can cut it up. You can, you know, do whatever you need to do with it, but ultimately, uh, needs to be inspect inspected. And we're going to go into that a little bit more thorough here. So a body harness is obviously the part that goes around us. You want it to fit snug. Um, it's going to hit the five major, uh, it's called, typically called a five point harness. Uh, it's going to be around the five um, strongest parts of our body. So the thighs, pelvis, waist, chest, and shoulders. Um, that, that's the strong part of our body because this is going to uh, absorb a lot of force if we actually do fall. Um, and, and it can be extremely painful. So you definitely want that dispersed across the stronger parts of your body. So you definitely want it to be secure. If you notice the configuration of the lower straps around the thighs, if those aren't secure and uh, something can, uh, you know, kind of get in between that and your leg and you fall, um, it's going to be an extremely uh, bad experience. Uh, so you definitely want to make sure it's snug and, you know, supposed to pull where it's supposed to pull uh, to protect you. So there's also D-rings. And the placement of the D-rings um, changes depending on the type of work you're doing right like you're obviously going to ha have one in the back sometimes you're going to want it higher uh sometimes you're going to want it lower right between the shoulder blades um you know you have side d-rings you have one in the front it just depends on what type of work you're doing so make sure if you have a harness uh it's it's correct for the type of work you're doing really connectors are any of the metal parts that you know hook or loop or a ring so they have to lock and they're double acting so you have to push in two places for them to open um, you know, like I said, there's, there's a lot of connectors on your system, so they should be able to move freely, right? They shouldn't be, you know, tied or, or twisted or bent or anything. They into that a little bit more thorough here. So a body harness is obviously the part that goes around us. You want it to fit snug. Um, it's going to hit the five major, uh, it's called typically called a five point harness. Uh, it's going to be around the five, um, strongest parts of our body. So the thighs, pelvis, waist, chest, and shoulders. Um, that, that's the strong part of our body because this is going to uh, absorb a lot of force if we actually do fall. Um, and, and it can be extremely painful. So you definitely want that dispersed uh, across the stronger parts of your body. So you definitely want it to be se secure. If you notice the configuration of the lower straps around the thighs, if those aren't secure and, uh, something can, uh, you know, kind of get in between that. So determining proper anchorage points, uh, as far as height goes, uh, essentially, you need to take a few different things into consideration. One, the height of worker. Um, two, the six-foot length of lanyard. 
three, the three and a half foot deceleration distance, and lastly, the safety factor. So you put all these together, uh, add them up, and that's how you get your anchorage point. A lot of times people forget the safety factor, but that's extremely important. So your lanyard is the length of uh, strap that goes from your harness to your anchorage point. Um, typically it's, you know, four to six feet. Uh, it can be flexible, it may not be flexible. Um, it may be fixed, just depends on what type of work you're doing. Uh, an SRL can also be used as a lanyard, and typically these, they're called self-restraining lanyards, or lifelines, and they prevent you from dropping if you fall. So they'll essentially catch you, or it's a little bit like a seat belt, or if it pulls hard, then it locks in place so that you don't fall any further. Obviously, the nice thing about that, and really the goal of fall protection, is fall prevention keeping you from falling over the edge, keeping you from falling down the ladder, holding you tight and preventing that fall from actually happening. So anchor point requirements, just like every part of the uh, fall protection system, need to be able to withstand 5,000 pounds. Um, so each, each connector on your harness has a 5,000 pound uh, pull rating on it. Now once you've fallen in the harness, um, actually fallen, not like, you know, been held by the SRL, that, that harness needs to be uh, removed from service as well as the lanyard because essentially they've they're designed to be pull tested once or you know essentially acted on once not not more than once so we want to make sure it can hold on uh, 5,000 pounds um, and that's kind of the, the the main point of the anchor so you know handrails guardrails not a 5,000 pound uh, tie-off point as I mentioned before they are designed for <clears throat> some sort of impact but it's 200 pounds outward pressure. So basically, a, a you know 200 pound person can push against it. It's not going to break or bend on them. Um, but as far as falling downward, they're not designed for five. They may be like you know certain um, you know uh, uh, barricades or handrails may be designed for that, depending on where you're at. But nine times out of ten, they're not going to be. So storing harnesses and taking care of them. You know, I recommend hanging them if you got a nice, dry, clean place. Um, you can put them inside of a storage bin, such as the one in the photo here. Um, but you want to make sure that they're mostly out of sunlight. That's that's the real killer of the material in, in harnesses is sunlight. So the less sunlight, the better. But chemicals, oil, uh, ink, you don't want to mark them because that can degrade um, the webbing of the harness and lanyard as well. So kind of wrapping up uh, fall protection. Um, obviously keeping your work area clean so that there's nothing to trip on is big. Um, we're going to talk a little about ladders here in a minute. Uh, you want to check harnesses, um, make sure you inspect them, that there's nothing, you know, there's not frays or holes or uh, sunlight hasn't beaten down and, you know, kind of degraded uh, the, the quality or integrity of your harness. Um, all the fall arrest components need to be free to move. They can't be rusted, etc. Check your anchor points. Make sure they meet that 5,000 uh, pound um, mark, which, you know, if they're manufactured for this purpose, they will. And then obviously make sure that they're clean and stored properly. So moving into stairways and ladders. So, you know, for the most part, um, you know, man lifts are always going to be better than using a ladder. But if there's instances where we can't use them, uh, we definitely want to make sure that our ladders meet the requirements of, of our needs. So the hazards, um, stairways and ladders may cause injuries and fatalities among workers. Um, this is a photo I actually took uh, myself. This individual was uh, stepping between two ladders in order to hang that piece of fascia there. Uh, I think he was about 18, 20 feet up. Uh, his name was Noah. I actually met him after this photo and talked to him. Uh, he, you know, was taking a risk here and, uh, you know, definitely could have been in a lot Worst condition, he did survive the situation, but it was a little bit of a mess. So slips, trips, and falls on stairways and ladders can happen. Um, so by the end of this training, we want to make sure that we under understand the requirements for stairways and ladders and the safe practices and requirements as well. So stairway or ladder, uh, there must be a stairway or ladder uh, point of access where there's, there's an elevation break of 19 inches or more. So that's pretty much our standard. Hey, is there you know a 19-inch break here? We need to have some you know some sort of step or whatever. Um, so loading docks, etc., um, need to have. So a handrail is obviously what we um, 
you know, put our hand on when we walk up the, the uh, staircase. The stair rail is actually preventing you from falling over the edge of it, right? So you probably have a handrail heading upstairs, but you probably also have a wall on both sides. Whereas, you know, typically in a lot of um, open areas, you're going to need that stair rail, uh, such as, uh, you know, at a, at a tank battery. So the strength, as I mentioned, needs to have a 200 pound uh, inward <clears throat> or outward um, rating. So it needs to be able to prevent somebody from falling through it. Um, stair, rails, stair rails with four or more risers are what require that handrail. So this would be a no-no here. Uh, if it has four or more, you need a handrail. Have the stairs by themselves. Um, <clears throat> stairways with uh, four or more risers or more than 30 inches high must have a stair rail along each unprotected side or edge. So that's a no-no there. And obviously during construction, I mean, you see this a lot. Um, it's pretty normal, but ultimately, you know, if that, if that guy were to just, you know, trip or <clears throat> slip, if, if it had just rained, he's going to have a very bad day. So dangerous conditions that exist out there, obviously slippery surfaces, etc. So one question I have is, <clears throat> you know, what can we do about, uh, stairs, whether over the, the containment, uh, system or the dike, uh, heading up to the tank battery when it's icy, uh, you know, those are metal stairs. Um, depending on the type of stairs and cleats aren't always the best option because they can cause more of a trip hazard. So what can we do? And really this kind of falls into the work practice side of things, you know, walking slowly, uh, taking small steps, not being in a hurry, not carrying heavy things if you can avoid it, uh, et cetera, because all those things are going to throw off your balance. If you do find yourself falling, roll with the fall. Don't reach out, uh, bend your elbows and knees use your legs and arms to absorb the falls. So you kind of want to do one of those duck and roll situations. Um, protect uh, the vulnerable parts of your body like the head, neck, and spine. And then don't move if you think you've hurt yourself. Wait for help. And I like to put if applicable in there because, you know, if you're out there by yourself three hours from anybody and you've fallen and you're not sure, you're probably not going to get a lot of help anytime soon. But stability of the spine is one of the most important things in the instance of a fall. To make sure that you don't do any nerve damage because you can uh, you know if you weaken part of that spine um, and you move it um, you can definitely do some serious potentially disabling uh, nerve damage and continued damage so keep that in mind and then also you want to you know slap your ground slap the ground with your hand and extend fingers to absorb impact so believe it or not that's that's a good thing if you start falling man be like I'm gonna slap the I'm angry at the ground I'm gonna give her a nice little little smack into uh, that way, um, you make sure that uh, your fingers aren't going to get hurt. But you want to slap it. You don't want to brace yourself because that is not going to work. So rule of thumb here, if you drop it, pick it up. If you spill it, wipe it up. Keep your eyes on your path or just completely stop moving. Um, if you got to take a text, read your email, stop moving, do your business, and then get on going again. So wrapping this show up, uh, remember slip strips and falls are preventable. They are the leading cause of injury every year by far. Like it's a significant difference. So keep that in mind. Uh, always perform a site walkthrough prior to performing work um, that will, you know, especially if that work will travel with you as the day progresses. And remove obstacles, materials, cords, rocks, etc. that may prevent you from completing your task, completing your task safely um, and efficiently. And lastly, look before you step, especially out of a vehicle, and always use three points of contact. That wraps up our training for the day. So thank you very much for tuning in today to Walking Working Surfaces and Slip Trips Falls Part A and B. I know you're going to be looking up those statistics on OSHA this weekend. Saturday night, man, you're just going to make yourself, you know, a nice grape juice and peanut butter jelly sandwich and just curl up next to the couch and be like, man, I'm going to dive into these oceans. I'm going to dive into these ocean statistics. I know it. Y'all there have a great safe day and keep that safety going.